Well, thanks, Nina, and uh, thank you to all of you who are here tonight. Like Nina said, uh, we really, really appreciate having you here. And uh, all of those folks who are joining us on, uh, watching on TV or online on YouTube, we'd like to uh, say hello to you, too. Um, some of you who have been here in the past, I recognize some faces familiar from problems in the past. And you probably recall that I always start out by saying how important it is that we're here to do this. And in this world where politics has become a, a very difficult thing to discuss in person, and uh, oftentimes it just happens behind a computer screen or in headlines and uh, very emotionally heightened uh, situations where we don't really stop and break down the issues and really listen to each other. So coming together in forums like this is extremely important. So tonight, um, we're going to get the chance to hear directly from the people who put their name in the hat. They want to represent all of us from the 5th Legislative District down in Olympia. And they'll be making really, really critical decisions on behalf of 7.5 million people in Washington State. Did you guys stop and thought about that? Seven and a half. It's a lot of people. So um, really important to hear from them tonight. But before we meet the candidates, what I want to do is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, if I can find my mouse here, we're going to talk a little bit about the 5th Legislative District. Um, so oftentimes, when we start having forums, when we start talking about elections, a lot of times we maybe don't know the, the geographical area that these folks want to represent. So Issaquah is in the 5th Legislative District, and it's huge. It shares this district with a lot of cities. Uh, in the north, it nearly reaches Stevens Pass. In the south, it almost reaches Enumclaw. And in the east, it does touch Snoqualmie Pass. And in the west, we've got cities like Issaquah, where you've got fast-growing semi-urban areas, you've got corporate entities, um, fast-growing neighborhoods and uh, a lot of development taking place. So you can see it is a large district with a lot of varying needs. Um, so whoever represents us needs to have a, a good understanding of all of the constituents here. Um, the fifth is one of 49 <coughs> districts across the state of Washington. And when we elect folks for each district, we have two state representatives that serve in the state house of representatives. We have one state senator for each district that represents us in the state senate. And currently in the 5th district holding those seats for us is Paul Graves, who's with us here tonight. Uh, Jay Rodney, who is not running for re-election after serving for quite some time. And Senator Mark Mullet, who is not up for re-election this year. He will be up for re-election in 2020. Currently in the Washington State House of Representatives, uh, it is controlled narrowly by the Democrats with a margin of 50 to 48 and another narrow margin for the Democrats in the Senate, 25 to 24. So hopefully that gives us a little bit of a lay of the landscape of what are these folks running for, what's the geographical footprint that they want to represent, and um, as we get to know them a little bit more, hopefully that helps us all out in, uh, in, in making our decisions here about who to vote for. So. Before we meet the candidates, uh, the format for tonight, we're going to have an opening <coughs> statement. I will make sure that we rotate thoroughly through the round so everybody gets a chance to go first and second and stays paired with their opponent. I think it is important to point out that we have two sets of opponents here. They are not all four running uh, as, a, as a group. Um, there are two, two sets of opponents. We want to make sure we keep them together in their answers. The topics were collect, uh, that we put out to the public were gun violence, immigration, trade and economy, uh, taxes, health care, leadership and governing style, and other. So um, these, oh, I'm sorry, education and education uh, policy uh, were also included in that. So as we took in the uh, topic, the questions from the community, it was kind of my job to put them together and uh, make sure we get as much answered as we can from what came in. So let's meet the candidates. I'm going to start here with Chad, who's closest to me. This is Chad Magandens. Chad served 12 years as an officer in the Navy. Uh, he spent 10 years at Microsoft, where he's responsible for over 20 patents. 14 years as a software design consultant. He has already represented the 5th District in the legislature um, in a prior term from 2013 to 2017. Uh, prior to that, he served on the Issaquah School Board from 2008 to 2013, serving as its president for two years. He's been married for 29 years to his wife, Galen, and their children, Quinn and Duncan, are off to college. So, empty nester here. Let's hear it for uh, Chad Magandans. 
Thank you, folks. And Nate, you took all my thunder there. I mean, I, I basically <laughs> well, get right into why I'm running. Chad, I'm um, going gonna, gonna to steal more thunder because I'm going to go ahead and introduce the rest of the candidates and then we're going to come oh, back okay. for opening statement. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But hold that. Hold that thought. Uh, Chad's opponent is Bill Ramos, not Ramos. He made sure I remembered that before him. Uh, Bill Ramos. Uh, Bill was elected to the Issaquah City Council in 2015 after serving on three separate city commissions prior to that. Uh, from 05 to 13, Bill worked for the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Transport Transit Administration as a community planner. Uh, prior to that, Bill was stationed in the U with the U.S. Forest Service in North Bend. Uh, he also has owned a dancing business where he taught ballroom dancing, salsa swing, and Latin dancing. Very interesting. Uh, Bill is currently a small business owner. His company, The Common Good, is a consulting firm specializing in transportation and transit projects. Bill and his wife, Sarah, live in Issaquah. They have two children that both graduated from the Issaquah School District. So please help me welcome Bill Ramos. And next to Bill, we have Paul Graves. Uh, Paul is the incumbent to this seat. He is running for re-election. He was elected to the position in 2016 and is finishing his first term. He was born and raised in Maple Valley. He attended Western Washington University where he was the student body president. Uh, earned a law degree from Duke University and he worked for a law firm Perkins Coie, uh, but now serves for an in-house, as an in-house attorney for a family owned trucking company. Um, lives in Fall City. He also serves as the chair of the board for the Washington State Institute of Public Policy and he's on the board for Hope Link. Uh, Paul is married to his wife, Jenny, and his son is Chad. So please help me welcome Paul. <laughs> and here we have at the, at the end of the table, um, last but certainly not least, is Lisa Callen. And Lisa, uh, before I introduce you, I will say you'll get to start for opening comments since we introduced you last. So. Okay. Uh, Lisa is currently serving her second term on the Issaquah School Board. She was elected in 2013 and re-elected last fall. Uh, she earned a bachelor's degree in math from Northern Arizona University. She spent 18 years with Boeing as an engineer and an, in software development. Uh, she's been a volunteer with the Claire Beckett Guild for Children's Hospitals and King County United Way. Uh, Lisa and her husband, Brian, have a son named Riley, who will graduate in 2023, if I read That's that correct. correctly. That's All right. correct. So please help me welcome Lisa Cowan. Okay, in our opening statements here, what we'll do is we'll start with Lisa, and we're going to uh, work our way this way. Um, in an opening statement, um, as many of you have been to political forums in the past, I'd like to encourage the candidates to talk about who you are as a person. We're going to have plenty of time to talk about policy and all the other stuff, but tell us who you are. What do you enjoy? What should voters know about you as the person, uh, not just the elected official? So Lisa, we'll go with, start with you, and you have 90 seconds. All right. Ready, set, go. So first, a huge thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening and to the volunteers that are helping, um, Nate, Renee, and the Highlands Council for the, this great chance to interact with you and answer and learn more about what is important to you. Um, so I did come from Arizona to work for Boeing straight out of college in simulation software development to verify engineering designs for brand new airplanes and commercial aviation. I'm very uh, passionate about aviation. Um, so that was how I got started here and fell in love, of course, with the water and the green. Um, so with all of that and all of the work that I've done and connecting with my community and engaging and having an opportunity to go through um, working here and play and live here as a mom and as an engineer and certainly as a, um, a person that's vested in our ability to thrive, uh, I wanted to make sure that we've got the right folks in the legislature that are bringing home all of the opportunities to protect our environment, to make sure we have safe communities, to make sure that we're figuring out how to manage our growth. And, and I'm looking forward to talk about all of those issues more. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And to you, Paul. 
Well, I'm going to apologize right at the very outset. You see, my wife, my lovely, talented wife, is nine months pregnant. Her due date was yesterday. yesterday. I wouldn't normally turn my phone off, but I'm going to have it right here. <laughs> there is a not insignificant chance that I'm going to pick up and just leave here. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I think you're all lovely and wonderful for being here. It has nothing to do with you and everything to do with a new life coming into this world. But I really am grateful that you're all here tonight. I'm grateful to get the chance to talk with you. I'm Paul Graves. I'm finishing my first term as your state representative. I was born and raised right here in this area. Um, I have devoted a significant amount of my legal career to representing foster kids in trial courts. For my work, I was named the pro bono lawyer of the year by King County's leading foster youth advocacy organization. And I've just tried in my first term to bring that same kind of compassion and dedication on your behalf to Olympia. Um, I've also tried to serve you independently and thoughtfully and bipartisanly. Based on my voting record, uh, an independent group said that I had the most independent voting record in the entire legislature. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that I will always listen to you over any party or any special interest. And one example of that uh, is the, that I really want to highlight is I was the only East Side legislator to vote against this really bad bill that would have shielded most of our records from public review. I think at a bare minimum you deserve an open and transparent government, about, and I will keep fighting for that and I'm really looking forward to talking with you tonight. Thanks very much. Thanks, Paul. And to you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming and having this event. Uh, really appreciate being here. And I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about myself also, uh, because I've been knocking on doors since February, over 11,000 doors so far. And people are telling me exactly that, that they want to know a little bit about us as people, not just what we stand on the issues. So um, I moved here in the late 80s, moved into North Bend. Um, and so I've been here 30 years in King County, half of that in North Bend, the Suquamish Valley, and half of that here in Issaquah. So I've lived in two major parts of the district, and that's one of the things that helps me be uniquely qualified to represent all the 5th District. Um, how did I get to North Bend? Well, I was born and raised in East Oakland, California. I got interested in environmental <laughs> stewardship and uh, ended up looking for a job and got one with the U.S. Forest Service and spent 30 years working for the U.S. Forest Service. After that, I spent eight more years in the U.S. Department of Transportation. Another thing that I will bring is my professional level skills in environmental stewardship and transportation work. Um, as you mentioned, the 5th District is a unique district. It is, has parts or all of seven different cities and all the unincorporated rural King County parts in between. Having lived a very rural lifestyle, coming to North Bend was coming to the big city for me from where I'd been, I really understand the rural side of the communities as well. So again, I think that will help me really represent everyone in the 5th District, and uh, thank you. Okay, and we'll finish with Chad. Chad, now you get to go. <laughs> All right, thanks, Dave. <laughs> So I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm really a pretty simple guy. I, uh, I like to build things. And so I've never really worked in government other than my military service. But I came up through the ranks and eventually ended up where I am because I wanted to kind of pay it forward. I started with a group called uh, uh, Safe Roads for Issaquah when we were working on traffic congestion issues. And I got involved in the PTA. I was Washington State uh, PTA Outstanding Advocate. I started getting involved in education. I was a team leader for Stanford Children, the key advocate for Leave Education Voters. Then I got on the school board, president of the school board. And the next thing you know, I'm in the legislature, like an honest politician, is, if there is such a thing. Um, so I, uh, I, I was quickly elected to caucus leadership. I was ranking member of the House Education Committee and then was one of the lead negotiators for the McCleary School Funding Remedy. So very excited to kind of be very relevant. And during that time, we, we increased state K-12 uh, funding by 105%. So I'm very happy with those results. So in the last couple of years, you know, people have been asking me why I ran for Senate. And uh, the truth is, I gave up a pretty safe House seat because I believe in a balanced legislature. And I wanted to preserve the, uh, the one seat majority that we had in the Senate because when both parties are at the table, we get a much better end product. And uh, I believe strongly about that. But for the last two years, I haven't been idle. I've uh, got my own startup now. And I actually teach computer science. Uh, I'm one of the TEALS instructors, a program we started when I was on the school board. And I uh, teach at Gibson Eck, one of the innovative schools that I helped create when I was president. Thanks. Thank you, Chad. So uh, for the first round of questions, uh, we're actually going to go backwards in the reverse order now down the table here. So everybody gets a chance to go first and second. Uh, and this question has to do with education funding and policy. We sort of lumped one qu uh, two questions into one. And we'll give everybody two minutes to reply. <laughs> just to, um, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, hefty topic, so we want to make sure we hear from everybody thoroughly here. So in June of this year, the Washington Supreme Court finally declared that the state had implemented its plan to fully fund education, part of the McCleary decision. 
Uh, since 2012, the state legislature has poured several billion more dollars into the uh, budget. Uh, two billion of that was for increases to teacher compensation. Now, despite this infusion of cash, we still saw as the school year started, several districts had teacher strikes, uh, went on for a long time in a battle about how to allocate that extra money. <clears throat> Uh, if voters vote you to uh, represent us in Olympia, what are your opinions and priorities for what remains to be done going forward when it comes to policy and funding for education? Chad, we'll start with you. So as one of the lead negotiators, I was a little frustrated because um, the levy swap, which was our last bit to fund the, uh, the remaining money needed to get us in good graces with the courts, was intended to be uh, a raise of the state uh, property tax commensurate with a lowering of the local property tax, and that would allow us to have a legitimate constitutional funding source for what the courts wanted us to pay for. Um, the problem is that when it went through the budget negotiations, it got bumped up at the state level this year. It doesn't go down until next year. So the problem with that is that the, the districts are very rich right now with additional state money, but they're going to lose a lot of that next year. And they're doing collective bargaining and basically bargaining at our current levels without looking forward to the reductions in local funding that's, that's going to come. So I'm a little concerned that several districts um, are going to be violating the law next year. They're going to be either uh, in trouble <coughs> legally or they're going to be breaking their contracts. And there's going to be a lot of pressure for the legislature to let go of those taxpayer protection measures that we fought so hard for. 44% of school districts are actually seeing a net levy rate reduction. Um, if, if we let that go, in addition to being in trouble constitutionally, we're, uh, we're going to have a, you know, a, a, instead of a levy spike, we're going to have that continue on with these higher property tax rates. And I don't think that was the intent of the group, because I was a member of that group. I can attest to that it wasn't the intent of that. There's a lot of work to do to make sure those taxpayer protections stay in place. But also there's some tweaking we need to do around special education funding, which should come from the state. Um, and we need to uh, look at our pro uh, prototypical school model, how we basically <coughs> fund for local districts. We fund one nurse for about 5,000 kids. It's crazy. Um, we also need to up our rates for counselors, especially in light of a lot of the suicide issues that, that we've seen, especially in our district. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the national rate for high school is 25% of deaths are, are from suicide. In the state of Washington, it's 37%. And so we have an issue here, and we need those folks to help on the ground. Thank you, Chad. Uh, same question to you, Bill, and let me know if you need any part of it repeated. I think I'm good. Thank All you. Right. Um, so I'm really happy that the, uh, the state legislature is out from under uh, McCleary in the court. That is important. So the legislature can really do their job the way it's intended and not be overseen by the court. So that was a good step forward in getting out from under that uh, contempt. But we have a lot of work yet to do. It's just the first step in that direction of, of the, the education funding we have to do. I know that for me, and I assume for all of you, your kids are your most important thing in the world, right? Your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, wherever their kids are going through school, we need to take the best care of them and give them the best opportunities. A lot of more pieces that we need in, uh, to fund are mentioned special education, definitely. <laughs> but also uh, the pre. Uh, K to uh, pre-K learning, excuse me, birth to, to kindergarten. That is where we're going to get a lot of social equity in the future. That's a place where we need to get our kids started so they have an equal shot and they don't get into school behind everybody else. So that is, is very important to me. Also coming out the other end, right now we have a big focus on four-year colleges and universities, <coughs> which is great for many kids, but not for all kids. We need to have a lot of different programs in apprenticeships. We have to work with unions to deal with, with get these other options, work with vocational schools and certification programs, and many other opportunities for kids where we need a lot of jobs that are going to be good, uh, you know, good paying jobs that people can raise a family on. We need that. Um, so. The funding that's going to come, has, we have to continue to do that. Right now, the, the taxes are really hard. That increase in property taxes was just outrageous in, in Western Washington. Eastern Washington received a reduction in taxes. And I would represent this district really well and not let us get the big burden of that tax increase while other districts get a reduction in taxes. Because I've talked to all those people, and, and this is hitting seniors very hard, and I'm done. 
<laughs> Thanks, Bill. You're uh, Paul, same question to you. Great. Um, it's obviously to the good that the Supreme Court said after um, six years that the legislature is no longer under court control when it comes to K-12 funding. But that's just a, a statement that uh, we have reached the constitutional floor and we, there are still many things left to do. I think you're going to hear agreement among all of us that special ed funding from the state remains to be fixed. I think that with a doubling of K-12 spending in the last six years, we need to really make sure that we're spending that money well, that we have strong accountability measures, that we have good audits, and that we're tying that spending to student outcomes, but in terms of graduation rates and high school dropout rates and what people are doing in their four years after high school. I think those are going to be some of the really key metrics that we need to be looking at as we see how this new doubling of funding goes through to schools. We um, need to spend a lot of the time uh, on mental health it's just one of the biggest kind of both unspoken about issues and unaddressed issues when it comes to education. Um, we've, we represent Tahoma here in this district and they had two suicides right to begin the year and it's a tragedy and we don't talk about it nearly enough and we need to do a lot better. Um, since we've spent so much time in the last six years working on K-12 funding, we've missed, I think, part of the opportunity to connect what people learn in K-12 with what they're going to do in college and then in their careers. We really need to connect learning with careers. I think the Snoqualmie Valley School District is doing some really neat stuff with uh, doing apprenticeships, even in high schools, and encouraging students, even at that young age, and especially students from low-income backgrounds who don't see a broad variety of professions that are available to them to show them in high school exactly what kind of careers they have and then what they can, they can do now to reach those careers. Thank you. And uh, we'll finish with Lisa. <clears throat> sure. So, um, so, yes, we've met our constitutional obligation. I think that um, Paul stated the floor. I think that's exactly it. So when I kind of draw this, um, this box, so what the state is paying for is this, which has been defined as basic education, what our students need to thrive in the 21st century is really this, right? So how do we balance that all out? Um, the choice of using property tax to make sure that we're fulfilling our paramount duty uh, was a, a difficult choice because it starts to pit those folks that are on fixed incomes um, against what our youth need. We need to make sure that we are making accountable every bit of that additional investment that came in, making sure it's going to reach the highest impact. We absolutely need to make sure that's happening, but we also have to make sure that we're keeping pace with what our kids need to really thrive and make it through the 21st century and where we're going. Career connected learning is huge and it is very expensive and we need to engage partnerships with our business. I think one of the ultimate things that we're doing as we're working through this transition is it's not all about um, giving away some high one-time money that came into a school district in one year, I think that was mentioned earlier. It's really about the discrepancies in the law itself. There was a 3.1 cap that was put on by the legislature, and there was confusion by districts of how they were supposed to pay teachers. They eliminated salary schedules. They're leaving that up to 295 districts to make individual choices of how they're going to pay these teachers in a time of a shortage, in a time where we can't get people to come to the classroom to teach. All of that has to come to bear. Thank you, Lisa. And for the next question, then we are going to start with Bill and Chad, and then we will go to uh, Lisa and Paul. So uh, starting with Bill, um, many of our questions that came in from the community, probably not shocking to anybody, was had to do with traffic and congestion. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, shocker, huh? And um, seeing as how the 5th District is kind of in the crosshairs of this massive intersection, if you will, we've got Highway 18, we've got I-90, we've got Esquahobart Road, a lot of throughput, a lot of people trying to commute, but also trade. We've got, um, you know, vehicles trying to transport goods uh, through the area. So given all of this, as a legislator in Olympia, uh, what needs to be done to address the critical traffic problems of the 5th District? Bill. Thank you. Um, and you're absolutely correct. It is a uh, critical problem. And I, I will definitely focus, the number one thing I will focus on is Highway 18 and 90 interchange and the extension of 18 to four lanes. Because that is the critical piece in here that is, I, I believe it's a critical piece for the state as well as this area. As you mentioned that there's a lot of, not just people trying to get there, but with a lot of trucks. We've got a lot, of, a lot of transportation commerce going up and down through that area. And that is critical to our, our business side as well as everybody else. So that is a number one priority in the state. I will keep that moving absolutely as fast as possible. 
um, and, and get there because it's unsafe as well as everything else. In our district, we also care about Highway 169 as another uh, major point. A little south of here, uh, some folks here may not use it as much, but to this district, it's just as critical as, as that. Um, having worked um, uh, with Issaquah City Council and the Regional Traffic Coalition that was started by my ex-mayor Fred Butler back there in, in the, uh, of getting folks together. We, this is a regional problem. It's not an individual problem. No one can solve this by themselves. So all the cities, municipalities need to come together with the county roads and, and the uh, state and the feds to, to get the funding, design what we need to do that. And that's where I can bring that expertise I have with the U.S. Department of Transportation to get those folks that have a little bit more money than we do, we can bring those in and work together. Uh, to get those problems, but it's a thing that has to be worked with convening everybody together by ourselves. No one can do this. Okay, thank you, Bill. And to Chad. So uh, Bill's absolutely right. 169 is, is absolutely critical for this area, and it's been completely neg neglected, despite it being a highway of state significance that should have priority for state funding. When the uh, last transportation package was being farmed around and the, uh, the chair of the House Transportation Committee was asking for my vote. I said, you know, you put 169 in the queue and you've got my vote. And then she refused. Um, this area is being neglected while we got 6,050 homes going in a black diamond. And so we need people who are willing to push and push hard. And that includes when schedules slip. Bill mentioned the State Route uh, 18 and I-90 interchange project. That we fought to move ahead six years. And then just this year, it slipped back to and so unless we constantly are pushing to make sure these projects happen on time, they're just, they're not going to happen on the schedule we think. Um, the Isqua Hobart uh, regional work that, you know, Fred has been working on so diligently, now that started when I was in Safe Roads for Issaquah when we were talking about the bypass. You know, we knew this was a problem that was going to happen, and Fred, to his credit, predicted that we'd be, be reconsidering in 10 years. We're at that point now, and I've got an interlocal agreement that's being prepared by King County that will allow the relevant municipalities and the county to finally fund the bypass and the key intersections to improve um, the Issaquah Hobart corridor. And, you know, finally, I want to look at what we're building. So for example, in I-90 between Isquah and Eastgate, we had a peak use shoulder driving op option that Senator Mullet had, you know, to his credit, fought hard for. Um, we've converted that to a 24-7 lane. And my goal is to have more general purpose lanes, not hot lanes, not tolling. We need to provide more capacity. Thank you, Chad. And to Lisa. So I think we're all in agreement that we have to keep um, 18, Highway 18 and, and 90 on track. We need to move that forward. But uh, along with that, we need to make sure not only is it on time and on budget as we move that forward, but we have to start the work on the additional lane. So we have to get budget in the next legislative session to start the engineering works. Because ideally what we'd like to do is get that flyover happening, but then also have that work just right progress right into making sure those additional lanes all the way through on 18 is there's four lanes all the way down. That'll allow the highest capacity, most efficiency happening. So that I think we're all in agreement on, definitely. Um, the, the main thing that I guess I want to make sure that gets across here is the amount of work that I've seen as a resident and the ones that are impacted by traffic and what we're bringing to Olympia and how we're going to fight to get our piece of the pie in the next transportation package. How is that going to show up? We've done regional collaboration, um, I would say slightly. Uh, and not majorly, and we need to do a much bigger, much stronger voice. And it can't be one legislature going in and saying, this is how you're going to get my vote. It's got to be all the legislators in the fifth. It's got to be all the municipalities. It's got to be sound cities. We've got to tie in, show the economic impacts to our traffic and to our families' ability to live and thrive. And when you bring all of that collaboration together and that convening, which I haven't seen happen, what I'd like to see happen, I think we're going to um, make a difference and hopefully have some funding coming our way. All right. Thank you, Lisa and Paul. It's short-term, medium-term, and long-term things that we need to do for traffic in this really growing area. The short-term stuff is the 1890 interchange project. So much of the traffic here in Issaquah is because people coming from Maple Valley and Black Diamond are driving up on Issaquah Hobart Road because the 1890 interchange is a disaster. I drive the reverse of it every day, and sometimes I drive by three miles worth of headlights. And, it's, and I was really proud to be able to work in a bipartisan way with our Senate, uh, with our senator, and with the Democratic chair of the 
uh, Transportation Committee to get that project moved up by six years. That was the only project in the entire state to get moved up like that, and I was really proud to work on that. In the medium term, we need uh, more um, throughput and also smart transit. Um, this is an area where we're going to have cars for the medium foreseeable future, and we need to have smart transit, things like more um, park and rides, more bus rapid transit, and even things that are not really sexy, like van pools, but that believe it or not get a lot of cars off the road for a small uh, amount of money. And then in the long term, we have the same problem that East uh, Pierce and Snohomish County have. Um, we have these kind of growing population centers in the west, and then all of the areas here that used to be farmland, there are now big suburbs that have the same two-lane roads. And I'm putting together a group of uh, legislators from those areas so that the next time when this money comes free from these projects currently getting done, we can all go to them at the same time and say, hey, if you put these five projects that matter to us in your package, you're going to get all of our votes. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> So uh, this next question came in and under the category of other, but uh, I'll have to uh, move it over so you can understand where it's coming from in the uh, category of mental health. Um, now that the McCleary decision appears to at least be satisfied in the eyes of the court, a lot of people think that the next shift of focus will be to mental health in this state. Um, we've had issues around staffing and safety problems at Western State Hospital. Um, the governor announced earlier this spring a somewhat vague plan to address issues of mental health by 2023. Um, as a legislator elected to uh, represent us in Olympia, what are your thoughts and priorities around how we address mental health in Washington State? And we, on this question, are going to start with, oh, who did we go with last time? We are with... Um, Paul's going to go first, then Lisa. Okay. I really appreciate that question, and I really think this is a, this is something that I really genuinely deeply care about. Again, I've spent a lot of my um, career representing foster kids in trial courts, and the overlap between kids who are in foster care and kids with mental health problems is pretty deep. And um, without going too much into it, I have somebody very, very close to me in my family who has really significant mental health issues, and they're incredibly hard to deal with in a number of ways. There are some of the basic things we can do, like more work in schools, like for example, um, uh, if, if you've done any kind of therapy at all, you know about dialectical behavioral therapy, basically just a way of coping with your anger and with uh, some of your strong feelings and getting back to a reasonable place. I think we should have more of that um, in middle and high schools. We actually have the worldwide leader in that um, form of therapy, and they, and they have a curriculum that's really that, that teachers can get in their hands and can get to students. Um, those are the easy things. The harder things are the people with really serious mental health problems. A lot of them end up committing crimes but can't go to jail, so they end up in Western or Eastern State Hospital, and those hospitals are Frankly, they're, they're a disaster. We've been um, under a Medicaid uh, correction order for the last three years. We didn't do what we needed to do under it. We just lost $50 million worth of Medicaid funding. That was a failure of leadership, a complete disaster, and I think that we need more legislators who are willing to oversee and hold accountable those who are running those state institutions. Great, thank you. And Lisa? I think specifically addressing around the needs and the issues around Western, I, I understand that the number is like there's some 40% of current population of Western is ready to be discharged if they had services in their community. So I think that is one of the key things. We need to start to provide these services and get them out into our communities and be able to provide better quality, excuse me, better and more quality care in uh, where folks can be home and be around their support structures and they have all of the necessary uh, support they need both medically um, and with the mental health specialist right in their neighborhood. So if we can start to expand that network and create that collaborative and that, that spoke of support, I think that's huge. Um, and I think you can see a cost trade between that and a major institution in Western. I think that um, we certainly need to do better and can do better about providing frontline mental health supports in our jails and supports there and then getting folks to the treatments that they need and an earlier intervention point. Um, I too have an extended family member that um, suffers from uh, some mental uh, issues and, and uh, um, again, not wanting to get into too much uh, of the details in support of that, but when, you, when you're in there and you're working as a family member and live at Dear One, you know that the supports aren't always there and you don't always know the directions to go and you need to provide those and we need to provide them in, um, in our communities, I think we can do a lot more there. As far as school, uh, schools and where we can go with that, that's a funding issue, and we need to make sure that we're getting mental health support Thank you, to Lisa. all of our schools. Time is up. Um, we're gonna move to Bill now and uh, finish with Chad. Thank you. Um, mental health is a uh, crucial issue for me. 
Um, in the, I believe the state, I've read some things, we're like 46 out of 50 states in, in our mental health uh, uh, access. When folks need mental health issues, they need it, and they need it now, and they need it in their communities. They don't need one hospital at one end of the state. So access to, uh, to uh, health care is critical, and we don't have that now, and I can tell you by experience it's not there. Um, so access throughout the state in the different communities is what we need to build um, and, and have folks that, that um, can afford it. It's covered through insurance and those kinds of things. So they don't ha they're not going because they can't afford it either. Um, so access and affordability is, is critical. Um, <laughs> the governor actually asked me a little bit on this the other day when I was talking to him about helping him on this issue because he's developing a plan on that. And I want to work on that throughout the state, as you mentioned. We, we're just too many communities where it's just not there. Uh, people say we have access here. Well, maybe you do. I haven't found it very easily, but if you get out in some of the more rural areas, that's where, as I talk about particularly, you don't have access for 100 miles or more. That's really critical, and that could just be life-threatening very quickly. And dealing with those issues when they're uh, earlier on is just so much better and easier and definitely needed in our schools. Thank you, Bill. And Chad, we'll finish with you. So. Um... A lot of focus right now on the institutional aspects of mental health, and frankly, I think that's one of the least effective and most expensive ways to deal with these, these problems. Uh, but we tried to address it in the legislature, um, and we had some very specific remedies for Western State that were vetoed by the governor, and I was really surprised uh, that he went that route. And in the time, it's only gotten worse. Um, I still believe, though, that the best, the best treatments are local in our communities, and so I think we as a community need to embrace these. There's a lot of... Um, you know, not in my backyard kind of attitude when it comes to these facilities. But we need to recognize that you're going to get the best support when the community is there to support, as well as the family. We also want to empower the family to, be, to take a more active role in the treatment of their, of their uh, family. Um, Joel's Law was a bill that I supported while I was in the legislature, and that allows um, family members who have grave concerns about the uh, mental state of an individual to, uh, to actually ask for consideration from a judge to commit them involuntarily. Uh, and that would have saved a life in, uh, in University of Washington. Uh, it was a pretty gruesome tale if you haven't heard about Joel. Um, and in school, I think Lisa touched on, I mean, what we're doing right now in partnership with Swedish Issaquah is, is fantastic. And right now we're doing it for our comprehensive high schools in Issaquah Middle. Um, I feel we can expand that statewide. I think ours is a model that uh, can be applied more globally. And we're fortunate that we have such a facility, you know, top-notch facility nearby. Not every district has that. And so that's the challenge going forward is being able to find those partnerships where we can take advantage of them. Excellent. Thank you. So we're going to move to the next uh, topic here. And this is always a common question that comes in at these forums. And uh, in Washington State, we pass a biennial budget. So every two years, uh, whoever represents us will get to vote on a budget. So when it comes to budget and taxation in our state, what are your priorities and what are your opinions about what needs to be done? And for this round, we are going to start with Chad and go to Bill, and then Lisa and Paul. So I'm a uh, big believer in fiscal responsibility. That's one of the main reasons I consider myself a Republican. And on social issues, I tend to lean to the left, but I'm adamant about making every tax dollar you know, work to its furthest possible. Um, when we go through the budgeting process, there's a big push to spend money. It's easy to spend money. It's, it's hard to trim back. And we at this at home and in our businesses as well. It takes a certain amount of self-discipline. And what frustrates me is if you look at this year, for example, we had $2.3 billion of unexpected revenue. You know, <coughs> stuff that we didn't anticipate, it just the, the economy took an upward turn and we were sitting on $2.3 billion of extra money that was uncommitted. And yet, we still ran and raided almost a billion dollars from the rainy day fund. And if we can't have that discipline now while the economy is boom, booming, how are we supposed to be able to make ends meet when it comes down? And it will come down. These are cyclical. We will have down years. And so you know, when we were funding McCleary, for example, we got 40% increase in state funding for K-12 without touching taxes by prioritizing uh, new money that was coming in for education. We put three out of every four new dollars into education, and it takes discipline to do that. It's called priorities of government. You have to go through your highest priority down to your least, and that's how you budget. 
Um, I'm a big believer in that process, and um, I think that kind of discipline is only going to happen if we have equal representation of, of both parties at the table, because we have to balance out the, you know, the ideal spending strategies with the ideal savings strategies and find that, that common ground, that happy medium. Thanks, Chad. And Bill. Thank you. Um, some of my family have called me frugal. <laughs> Um, I'm a guy that just naturally wants to get a dollar's worth of value for every dollar I spend. And that's just a natural part of me. And I look at that in every budget I've ever worked at, whether it's, it's my personal budget, uh, a federal budget, a city budget. I just look at the details. I dive into those details. And I want to make sure we're spending things in the right way. What I can't ever abide by is just general cuts that say we have to cut taxes. Because if you do that, you don't know what you're cutting. <clears throat> There are some things that are really important to me. I was talking to a guy in the door the other day, and I said, if someone just said you're going to have to cut your budget 20%, I bet you you wouldn't cut your taking your kids to the doctor, would you? You'd sign a way to do that. You'd prioritize that over something else. I might think about cutting my vacation, right? So those are kind of things. When I want to look at cutting and, and be very specific, that's what we're going to look at. What do we need? What's most important? And where can we reduce or programs that aren't as efficient as, we, as we'd like them to be? We are very lucky now. Right now, our revenues are up. Our economy is booming. We should be able to work all these uh, <coughs> programs out and get what we need uh, with what we have at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And we're going to go to Lisa. So from my perspective, very first thing that we can, we can do more and what I would like to do when I get to the legislature is to make sure that when you're making these buying and budget decisions, you're looking at every uh, tax exemption tax break that is on the table so that you know exactly what's happening and what you're making your priority decisions around. So we know whether or not they're effective or they're useful. So if you take a specific industry and understand what their tax exemptions are that are built into the system and that's not looked at every four years or you don't know if they're really um, coming to the point where they're actually adding the public value for that year's priorities in the budget. So we have to have mechanisms in place to make sure that we can do that. That's part of staying accountable. That's part of making sure that our dollars are going to the right spot. The other aspect that we really have to do is hold the line on our property taxes. I think everybody felt that this last, this last session. We've got to hold that line. We've got to make sure that um, in the tax pie, we've got this tax pie and everybody's got their share. And we've got to figure out how we're balancing out everybody's share to make sure that it's getting to the greatest good and we're getting the most out of every single tax dollar. And I keep hitting that yellow sign and going, ah, <laughs> um, I'm where we're going. So I want to make sure that we've got more transparency. I want to make sure that we're holding property taxes. And then I want to make sure that um, as we're going through and paying attention to how every dollar is being spent, it's also making sure that we're following best practices. And with my engineering background, certainly with my school background, where we're balancing all of that, making sure we're balancing budgets, then we can negotiate contracts that are uh, sustainable that we do the same thing at the state level. Thank you, Lisa. And we'll finish with Paul. Great, thanks. Um, property tax relief is my top budget issue. The state has about an extra half billion dollars more than it thought it was going to even a couple months ago because the economy was really good. That's even after doubling K-12 funding in the last six years. You saw your property tax bill go, go up. I think that extra half billion dollars should be returned to taxpayers in the form of property tax relief. More generally, I think that we need to go back to what Gary Locke did when he was governor. Um, he had a priorities of government program where he had instructed his agencies to list in order the additional spending that they wanted to have happen in any given year and then it gave budget writers a much easier way to go through prioritize those things and spend money on what actually makes sense and what's good for uh, uh, costs and benefits. And on costs and benefits, um, Nate mentioned at the beginning, I, I chair the board of a group called the Washington State Institute for Public Policy. It's a bipartisan group of legislators and university researchers whose only goal is to look at state spending and potential government programs and try to balance out which ones pass a cost benefit test. And I think we should expand that quite a bit and do quite a bit more of that because you need to know, not just in the abstract, but in the real nitty gritty that the money that the, that the government is spending, you're getting more uh, benefit, benefit for it than it's costing. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> so for our next topic, we're gonna start with uh, Paul and Lisa, and then finish with Bill and Chad. Um, so if some of you joined us uh, in the spring for the primary for the US Congressional Race Forum that we held here, 
And in that forum, uh, a lot of the questions that came in the door had to do with gun violence. And this time it wasn't that different. We fielded questions about gun violence. Now, there's a different uh, narrative to talk about at the federal level, perhaps, versus at the state level. But folks were interested to know, uh, as a legislator rep representing us in Olympia, uh, what can we do in our state to address the issue of gun violence? And we're going to start with uh, Paul. Um, we can do a number of things. Um, I think we need to make sure that, uh, I guess to start from the background, I mean, these are constitutional rights we're talking about, but I think that we can also respect constitutional rights while reducing gun violence and keeping people safe. Um, I, I broke from my party to vote this year, for example, for a ban on bump stocks. Um, and even created a buyback program that made that even more of a bipartisan bill. Um, I also voted for a voluntary waiver bill that would have allowed you to put yourself on a do not purchase list. And the way I try to approach it is that um, we can uh, try to focus on individuals rather than more blanket bans. I think it ends up working best. That's why I end up supporting things like protective orders or saying that if you, yeah, I voted for a bill that if you have are a domestic, a domestic violence perpetrator that you no longer get access to a gun, things like that. I think we need to do better on our universal background check. I think we need to make sure that they're actually universal, and I think we need to make sure that that system that does the background check is better and more frequently updated. And then I think we can do a lot more on school safety as well. I've worked a lot um, with the school districts around here, and even with some of the student body governments um, to talk about ways to keep their students more safe, um, having more school resource officers and mental health counselors, and giving students the opportunity to uh, communicate freely with their administrators so that people can know when really big challenges are happening with some of the students and they can try to put a stop to gun violence before it happens. Great, thank you. And Lisa? <clears throat> so some of the things that Paul touched upon, we definitely do with my school board hat on, um, getting those calls when a student has uh, committed suicide or has uh, suicide ideation and the numbers, we track that very carefully. Um, so that's one of, you know, there's more students that, and more youth that die by gun violence than by cancer. The amount of research that is going into what we can do to reduce gun violence is, <clears throat> is minimal. So we definitely need to spend some money and some time to figure out and put some research on the data to make sure that we're putting dollars what's going to have the greatest impact. Um, from my perspective, I'm a supporter of uh, six, Initiative 1639, which basically takes handgun regulations that, put, uh, that are on handguns and puts them on um, long guns and rifles. I think the extended background checks is important. I think making sure that we have safe storage. I would rather see, rather the industry coming through after a product ban of a particular gun, figuring out how they can just come up with a new product to replace that. I would rather that money and that research be going into biometrics and how we can do uh, biometric safe storage, for example. Um, how do we make sure that those guns are staying out of the hands of our kids and out of the people's hands that um, make sure to not have them. We talked about uh, protection orders. I think that that's all well and good, but if you don't have a police force that's got staff to go out when the protection order has been put into place, then it doesn't do any good. They still can't go and pull their guns away. So it's a, there's a spectrum of work that needs to be done. There's a spectrum of work that can happen. Um, it's a huge topic that we can't deny, and I'm surprised more and disappointed that more didn't get done last session. Thank you, Lisa, and to Bill. Thank you. Um, this is this is a pretty uh, simple and direct thing for me. I'm one of those weird uh, Democrats that uh, is a gun owner. As I mentioned earlier, I lived in some pretty rural areas, and guns are uh, definitely a different part of life than they are in cities. Um, and so I understand guns. I understand. I can talk to folks. I mentioned all the doors I knocked down. I've talked to a lot of folks that are responsible gun owners. They own multiple guns, and they consider themselves gun owners that are taking the heat or a few folks that are causing problems. And they're tired of that. I've got some folks telling me on doors, we're voting for 1639 because we're responsible gun owners and we want everybody else to be too. And I'm supporting 1639. I think it's the right step in the right direction. As Lisa mentioned, it basically treats all guns the same as we treat handguns, because in the past we thought <coughs> handguns were the only thing we had to worry about and we found out that's not quite true. So we need to make that adjustment. There is no threat to constitutional amendments here. Uh, no threat at all. There's fear factors that people can try to use to say it's a slippery slope and you're going to lose the Second Amendment. That's not true. I don't believe that at all. I believe we can preserve that as a gun owner. I want my rights preserved, but we can still accept some changes to that that takes that uh, 
those few folks that we really don't want to have guns, we can do way better at keeping them away from them. And that will protect them and ourselves and our communities. Thank you. And Chad, we'll finish with you. So uh, how many folks remember when a uh, Maple Valley man was shot outside Isco High? He had opened fire with two rifles. I remember there was a football game going on in the stadium right there. Uh, I was on the school board at that point, and I was actually a couple years later inside Isqua High when we had a security <laughs> lockdown, and it was not a drill. We knew it wasn't a drill, and it was like a half hour before the good guys with guns showed up and told us we were safe again. Um, I put a lot of thought into this, and uh, I I've also am a defender of the entire Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, but I voted for some common sense gun reform issues. Uh, I stepped away from my party with House Bill 1840, which allowed us to disarm uh, folks who are under restraining orders. I opposed the bump stock. I have an NRA A minus rating, which is the same as the majority leader, Pat Sullivan. Um, but I think we can do some common sense things to, to make our, our process safer. And one of the things that I did was um, uh, we have instant background checks available through the watch system, which is hosted by the Washington State Patrol. I proposed legislation to, uh, to make that free so people could do an instant background check at time of sale. Um, school shootings are really what I've been focusing on because of my focus on education. And uh, you know, we've supported the school resource officers, even when King County cut funding for that. We've invested millions in access control in our schools. I think that's all very important. But I think we need to keep things in perspective, too. Um, if you go through the last 15 years of CDC data, you'll find that uh, school shootings account for 0.06% of student deaths, less than 0.1%. Uh, when we've got the big picture problems of, of suicide at 37% in our state, and, uh, and bullying is really the underlying cause of a lot of these school shooting incidents. And creating a culture that does not tolerate bullying, I think, should be a priority for us. Especially with online. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Time is up. Time is up. So we are going to wrap up here with our closing statements. We were going to go with uh, Lisa, Paul, Chad, and then Bill to wrap it up. And you guys can all gather your thoughts for a minute to bring it home um, and let everyone remember you and your closing statements. Before we do that, I did want to make a quick announcement. We had a uh, candidate forum scheduled for the U.S. congressional race in the 8th District uh, coming up in October. We have had to cancel that forum, so I did want to let everyone know tonight. Um, we just were not able to uh, make schedules work with all the campaigns and their uh, commitments with TV appearances and debates and that sort of thing. So uh, we're, we're a little bit sad to, to make that announcement, but uh, we just couldn't, couldn't fit it in. Um, I'm sure the candidates will be appearing on local TV and other, uh, you know, other avenues for you to uh, take a look. So um, with that, we are going to go back to our closing statements here with our legislators. Uh, and Lisa, we'll start with you. You've got 90 seconds. So let us know how to remember you. All right. Well, thank you very much again for being here. I definitely want you all and certainly anybody that's watching this on TV to know that you can reach out to me uh, personally. Um, my cell phone is on my website. It's on material in the back. So please call me. I'd love to engage and learn more about what's important to you. Uh, a lot of the issues that were brought forward in questions are all tied back to what's the legislator's priority and how is your voice represented in Olympia. I think there was a lot of work that could have been done and can be done and needs to be done, and we need to make sure that we're doing it collaboratively. I've done that as a school board director for two terms. I've done that as school board president. Um, and I think that we continue to do that work. When we talk about things like mental health, when we talk about things like even bullying in schools, that all requires funding and uh, making sure that we've got the right staff in our schools, making sure that we've got access to the services that are needed, when and where they're needed, and how we make that happen. And that's all a priority for me, making sure we've got people first, making sure our dollars are going to the right spot, and making sure that we're engaging every voice and bringing every voice that should be represented to Olympia, and not just the loud squeaky wheels, not the ones that have the most money to show up in that party to make that happen. So um, I want to be your representative. I want to bring your voice and the issues that are right here in front of us, whether it's traffic or health care or school safety. Um, I like to get in deep, and I want to make sure that we're really representing um, all aspects of our community and every resident in our community. So thank you for that opportunity, and I hope I have a chance to earn your vote. Thank you, Lisa and Paul. Well, thank you again for uh, coming out here tonight and for listening to us talk. An hour doesn't really feel like nearly long enough to get into <laughs> some of the issues that we need to deal with. Um, I'll have the same thing. My, my material in the back and then my website also has my personal cell phone number and my email address that goes right to me. So please, by any means, uh, get in touch anytime you can. Um, Again, I've tried to represent you thoughtfully and independently in my first term. Uh, I've 
proud of the endorsements that I've earned because of that. I've earned the endorsements of the Seattle Times, the League of Education Voters, Stand for Children, the Children's Campaign Fund, Washington's Cops, the Washington's Fire Chiefs, and the Association for Washington Business, among others. And I think that a uh, diverse group of organizations has endorsed me because I have shown that I can be thoughtful and independent and effective. I mean, I've passed five bills as a freshman in the minority and worked very hard to get the 1890 interchange project moved up by six years. Those were huge, big wins. And I, you probably won't see me really getting involved in many nasty partisan, especially Twitter <laughs> online fights. That's simply not how I'm uh, constituted. It's not why I got into this. And I'll tell you in all candor, I, I get really frustrated, especially with what I see out of DC because it is so nasty and bitter and mean and I want none of that. So I can promise you that I will always try to um, represent you well and be kind and decent and I will always listen to you. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you, uh, Paul. And uh, I think for everybody here, uh, well wishes on the birth no of baby. child. No baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you he or she up. held on through this, and uh, and, and uh, we wish you well on the birth of your child. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go to uh, Chad, uh, and then we'll wrap up with Bill. <clears throat> Thanks, Nate. So um, in politics, talk is cheap. Um, anybody can pretty much say anything in a campaign, and very few people are held accountable for it. The advantage you have with me is that you have proof. I have not just talked the talk, I've walked the walk. Uh, I, I was voting more independent than 93% of the legislature during my two terms. I built coalitions. Uh, we talked about the school funding coalition, but I was also the prime sponsor for the coalition that saved charter schools. Uh, we went after school truancy issues, uh, the teacher shortage, electric vehicles, cyber crime, and cyber uh, security. In each case, I worked with my counterparts on the other side of the aisle to, to make this stuff happen. Um, if you look at the Muni League, uh, King County Municipal League, they go through and they ask not just people we give them for referrals, but our counterparts on the other side, so like the chair of the House Education Committee, other members of the McCleary negotiating team. And they told them the same thing that I'm telling you right now, is that you know, I have proven myself capable of working effectively across the aisle and finding that common ground, and they want to get me back in Olympia so we can continue that work. Uh, that's why the Municipal League has given me another outstanding rating. I've never gotten anything less than an outstanding rating from the Municipal League. I also have the Association of Washington Business endorsement. I have Stanford Children, League of Education Voters. But just last week, you may have heard that I got the uh, Seattle Times endorsement as well. I'm very happy to get another one of those. So, you know, getting to Paul's theme, if you want civil discourse in politics these days, you really have to elect someone who has a proven track record of being able to work across the aisle, and I'm that person. Thanks, Chad. And Bill. Um, thank you all very much for being here. Thank all the Highland Association for putting this on. I'm just humbled to be in this position right now. It's, it's just been an amazing uh, trip since I announced in February, or January actually, and I've, as I mentioned before, I've been knocking on doors and talking with folks, and it's just amazing what people have to say and what they wanna talk about, and, and that I can bring some of these skills, these things I mentioned that are unique to this district, understanding that whole district, the rural side, the small city side, bringing my uh, environmental skills um, and uh, transportation skills here. I've loved the legislative process. What I love, I, getting in city council and working through those things has just been a wonderful thing. You don't get to be a dictator. You don't get to decide anything. You have to get all the people to line up with you and convince them that you've got a good solution and work together towards something to make it right to better our communities. The only reason for government for me is to better our communities. That's the only reason. And the theme of my campaign is there's more that unites us than not. And I've found that on the doors as I talk to people of all parties, of all persuasion, and they sit there and they still want to talk with me. And they, oh, you're a Democrat. Well, okay, uh, how about this? How about that? And it's, I'm I come home and my wife says, oh, you've been hiding on the doors forever. What, what was it like? It was fun. I'm having a blast just to talk with people. So if I can leave you with anything, I'm having fun doing this. It's just a great time of getting to know folks, getting to know the district, and seeing what I can do to be a little more part of my community than I have in the past. And it took a lot of people to convince me to do this. And now I'm here and having fun with you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, all of you who are here tonight and everybody who's watching at home, um, you have a job to do after this. Uh, ballots are due November 6th. They will be hitting mailboxes a few weeks prior to that. 
Your job is to go out, find the recording of this that'll be posted on the City of Issaquah's YouTube channel and share it with as many people as possible. Nina will also be sending it out via e-blast for the Highlands. Um, we need to get that in the hands of folks who couldn't make it here tonight. Have them have the same educational experience that you did tonight. And then lastly, let's uh, give a round of applause for our candidates here. Well, you all just spent one late evening here. These folks, whoever wins, are going to spend many, many late evenings <laughs> in Olympia. <laughs> so uh, feel lucky that uh, you get to go home now. And these folks are probably going to go knock on more doors, or somebody might go have a baby. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Six uh, and one half dozen of you. <laughs> but thank you very much for being here tonight, and have a good evening.